This episode contains a frank discussion of vulgarities, obscenities, profanity, sexual hijinks, and flatulence. So, fair warning. Welcome to the History of English Podcast, a podcast about the history of the English language. This is episode 129, Chaucer's Vulgar Tongue. In this episode, we're going to look at the vulgar side of Geoffrey Chaucer. And when I say vulgar, I mean it in both the modern sense of the word and the original sense of the word. Vulgar originally meant common or ordinary, and Chaucer was one of the few English writers of the Middle Ages to paint vivid portraits of the common people of England. And those portraits included their language, the common language of the common people. Chaucer's ordinary characters curse and swear, and they tell stories that many people would consider to be dirty or obscene. It's a side of the English language that we don't see very often in the Middle Ages, and it's partly how the word vulgar evolved from its original sense of common or ordinary to its more modern sense of dirty, inappropriate, or unrefined. So this time, we'll examine how Chaucer used his vulgar tongue to depict the common and ordinary characters in the Canterbury Tales. But before we begin, let me remind you that the website for the podcast is historyofenglishpodcast.com, and you can sign up to support the podcast and get bonus episodes and transcripts at patreon.com slash historyofenglish. Now, a quick note before we begin. In this episode, I'm going to discuss the history of certain obscenities and curse words in English. So, if you're sensitive to foul language, be aware that we will be looking at some of those words in this episode. Also, I'm going to explore this topic in the context of the Miller's Tale as set forth in the Canterbury Tales. I had originally intended to include the Reeves Tale in this discussion as well, but due to time considerations, I've decided to move the Reeves Tale to the next episode, where I also intend to discuss Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Those two stories actually have one very important thing in common. They both illustrate the nature of English in the north of England in the late 1300s. So I'll cover those two stories next time. But for now, let's turn our attention back to the body side of Chaucer and his fascination with the more vulgar aspects of English. Before we began our look at the Canterbury Tales, we briefly looked at another one of Chaucer's important poems called Troilus and Cresside about two lovers during the time of the Trojan War. There's a scene in that poem where Troilus tries to convince Cresside to run away with him. He tells her that if he can speak plainly about treasure or money, they have enough to live comfortably for the rest of their lives. The line begins with the passage, and vulgarly to speak of substance of treasure, and vulgarly to speak of substance of treasure. But it meant to speak plainly or bluntly about money. Now notice that Troilus didn't say that money was obscene, and he didn't use any curse words in the passage. When he said that he was speaking vulgarly, he simply meant that he was speaking in the common or ordinary way that someone would speak about money. In other words, to speak vulgarly was to speak plainly or bluntly. And that's because the word vulgar actually meant common or ordinary. It's a loan word from Latin, and according to the Oxford English Dictionary, this passage uttered by Troilus is the first known use of the word vulgar, or a form of the word vulgar, in the English language. This sense of the word vulgar as common or ordinary is the same sense that we have in the term vulgar Latin, Many language historians refer to the vulgar Latin dialects that were spoken in Western Europe after the fall of the Roman Empire. Those dialects ultimately produced French, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, and the other Romance languages. Now, when scholars refer to these Latin dialects as vulgar, they don't mean that the dialects were crude or dirty. They simply mean that those were the Latin dialects spoken by the common or ordinary people in the various parts of Western Europe as opposed to the formal Latin used by the church. The point is that the word vulgar has always been used to make this basic connection between ordinary people and ordinary speech. But the modern sense of the word vulgar points to something else. It shows us that common, ordinary people 
often speak in ways that can be blunt and coarse. They don't always use the formal rules of language taught in school books, and they sometimes use words that aren't found in those school books and sometimes aren't even found in dictionaries. It's probably fitting that Geoffrey Chaucer was the first known English writer to use the word vulgar because he was also one of the first English writers to explore that basic connection between the common people and their common language. As we saw last time, Chaucer sometimes wrote in a high register when writing about noble characters or elevated topics, but he also wrote in a lower register when writing about common ordinary people, especially peasants and people who were rough around the edges, the type of people who Chaucer and some modern speakers would call churls. Words like vulgar and churl reflect this old idea that the common people tend to speak and behave in ways that are crude and unrefined. As I noted, vulgar originally meant common, and now it means inappropriate or obscene. Churl originally meant a common person, and now it means a rude or unpleasant person. Villain was originally a feudal term for a peasant. Now, with a slightly different spelling, it means an evil person or a criminal. And as we've seen before, the word lewd originally referred to common things in the secular world. It was often used to refer to common people who were not part of the clergy. But again, the word lewd has experienced this same decline over the centuries. Today, it means vile, lustful, or obscene. We see the same development in the word profane, which I also discussed in an earlier episode. The word profane is derived from the Latin words pro and phanum. Pro meant in front of, and phanum meant temple. So when those two elements were put together, it literally referred to things in front of the temple. But that also inherently meant that those things were outside of the temple. Again, it simply referred to common things in the secular world, as opposed to the church. But over time, it came to refer to things that were not appropriate for the church. So it came to mean dirty or vulgar. All of these words, profane, lewd, and vulgar, have experienced this same evolution from common to obscene. And that's an important reminder that words tend to change their meanings over time. When we use words today that are considered vulgar or dirty, we should keep in mind that those words didn't necessarily have that same sense in earlier centuries. Very often, they were just common ordinary words with common ordinary meanings. A good example of this is one of our modern four-letter words for excrement, the word shit. It's a very old word that was used by the Anglo-Saxons, and it probably goes all the way back to the original Indo-Europeans. The original Indo-European root word was something like skei, and it apparently meant to separate or divide. That meaning included situations where something was cut off or removed or separated from a larger object. Since bodily waste was removed from the body through defecation, that old root word was applied to that process. The same root word was applied to the process of removing objects from the outside of the body as well, like clothing. To remove clothing or other objects from the body was to shed them from the same root word. Of course, it could also apply to skin, as when a snake sheds its skin. The same root word was also applied to the process of removing wool from a sheep. In that case, it produced the word shear. Sometimes ancient people would split a large tree trunk in half, and then they would hollow it out to create a boat or a sailing vessel. That process of division and separation and removal of wood waste created the word ship from the same root. Sometimes a flat piece of wood cut from a tree was used as a roof covering. That piece of wood was a shingle, also from the same root. So shit, shed, shear, ship, and shingle are all cognate, according to language scholars. They all evolved from the same root word, meaning to split or divide. And all of the examples I just gave are words that were used in Old English. In the case of our common four-letter word for excrement, it's older than English itself. The word was used in that same sense during the earlier Proto-Germanic period, 
And scholars know that because other modern Germanic languages have their own version of that word with essentially the same meaning. For example, modern German has the word as Scheisse, and some English speakers actually use that German version of the word in place of the English word. It's close enough to the English word that most people recognize it, but it doesn't have the same taboo as the English word. By the way, some scholars think that the German word Scheisse is actually the source of the modern word Scheister. Scheister means a crook or a cheat, and it appeared in English in the 1800s. Some linguists think that it came from a German word meaning a worthless person, which itself was derived from Scheisse. So, English is not unique in having a version of this word. The English version is very old, going all the way back to the Anglo-Saxons, but that's not to say that the meaning has remained the same over all those years. While the word is always referred to dung or excrement, it originally had a more restricted sense. In Old English, it was limited to the waste created by farm animals, and more specifically, it usually referred to diarrhea in cattle or sheep. And it wasn't really an obscene word at the time. In fact, Geoffrey Chaucer used it in the general prologue of the Canterbury Tales. In his description of the parson, he says that the parson was a true man of God and not corrupt like some members of the clergy. He then chastises corrupt priests with the following passage. And shame it is if a priest take a cape, a shit in shepherda, and a clean shape. In modern English it reads, And shame it is if a priest takes keep, a shitty shepherd looking after clean sheep. This passage is generally interpreted to mean that a corrupt priest is basically a dirty shepherd looking after his congregation, who are the clean sheep. So in this passage, the word shitten is used literally to mean a sheep covered with dung or excrement. It's really just a descriptive term meaning filthy or dirty. The word didn't become truly obscene in its modern sense until the 1800s. So at this earlier point, it was still a common descriptive term. By the way, there's another popular etymology for the word that has traveled far and wide in the age of the Internet. The story goes that ships often transported animal manure to be used as fertilizer, and if the manure was stored in the bottom of the ship, water could seep in, causing fermentation and methane gas. And that could cause the ship to explode. So the bundles of manure were stamped with a warning that read, Ship High in Transit. And that warning was supposedly reduced to the initials S-H-I-T. According to this story, the word is really an acronym. But as we've seen, the word is actually much older than this story would suggest. And there's no actual evidence to support this story. No one has ever found any references to that type of warning used on ships. And furthermore, acronyms didn't really exist until the past century or so. They're very much a product of the modern era. So, old words that have been around for a long time are almost never the result of an acronym. Now, as I noted, the word shit was originally a common descriptive term for animal feces, and it wasn't necessarily vulgar. But during the Middle English period, it did acquire an association with vulgar speech. In an earlier episode, we looked at a poem called The Owl and the Nightingale. And in that poem, the author used the term shit word for vulgar or coarse language. Again, the word shit itself wasn't really obscene, but it was used to coin a term for obscene words. That poem also used the term fulawart or foul word. Again, both of those terms implied that the words in question were dirty or foul, and therefore not appropriate for polite society. So, what kind of words were considered foul or dirty? or inappropriate. Well, generally speaking, the most taboo words in the Middle Ages were swears or curses, but not swearing or cursing in the modern sense of those terms. People were far more concerned about language that tended to offend God or challenge the teachings of the church. That type of language tended to be more offensive than words for body parts or bodily functions. Swear is an Old English word. But in Old English, it meant to declare that something was true, 
usually on a holy relic or other sacred item. It was very similar to what happens today if you swear an oath in court. You might put your hand on the Bible and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Well, that was a far more common act in the Middle Ages. It was the way society was regulated. The entire feudal system was held together by lords and vassals swearing oaths to each other. Husbands and wives were bound together by oaths. Written contracts were rare, so most business agreements were confirmed with a similar exchange. Medieval society depended on sworn promises and oaths. And those oaths didn't really mean anything unless they were sworn in the name of God, meaning that the person risked divine retribution if the oath was broken. But sometimes people would swear to something that was untrue, so they would make a false oath, thereby challenging and ridiculing the power of God. And sometimes people would make a mockery of the oath, taking the name of God in vain. And they would even swear on the body or blood or nails of Christ. That invoked the crucifixion, and it was widely believed that such phrases literally inflicted pain and suffering on Christ. So that type of language was highly offensive, and that's how the word swear came to be used in the more modern sense of profanity. By way of example, it was common in the Middle English period for people to utter phrases like, by God, or by God's bones, or by God's nails. Those were similar to the more modern expression, for God's sake. In all of those cases, the form of the phrase was an oath, but it was being used as an expletive, so it violated the commandment against taking the Lord's name in vain. Some of these early swears still survive in disguised forms in modern English. The word blimey is apparently derived from the longer phrase, God blind me, which was once a common swear. The word drat is derived from the phrase God rot, as in God rot your bones or some other body part. Over time, God rot was slurred and shortened to drat. The expression gadzooks began as the phrase by God's hooks, and by George began as by St. George. At one time, a lot of people used the word zoons or zounds. It was a shortening of the phrase, by God's wounds. That was the usual type of swearing in the Middle Ages, and it was the type that Chaucer used throughout his poetry. He was a very active swearer in that regard, and his characters often spoke in that way. But in the Canterbury Tales, the elevated or noble characters rarely swear. Most of the swearing comes from the common, ordinary characters, who tend to come from the lower classes. The innkeeper and host, Harry Bailey, is one of the biggest offenders. At one point, he even gets into an argument with the parson over his language. When he invites the parson to tell his tale, he says, For God is bonus, tell us a tale. For God's bones, tell us a tale. The parson responds sharply, What aileth the man so sinfully to swear? What else the man so sinfully to swear? Later in the poem, the pardoner provides a sermon on swearing. In one passage he says, Of swearing says the holy Jeremiah, Thou shalt say truthful oaths and not lie. Swear in judgment and righteousness, but idle swearing is a cursedness. Of swearing saith the holy Jeremiah, Thou shalt say a sooth in oaths and not lia, and swear in dome and eken rectwisnesa. But easel swearing is a cursedness. So again, that last line is idle swearing is a cursedness, which meant wickedness. That's how the term swearing became associated with bad language. And when he says that swearing is a cursedness, he's alluding to another term that has acquired the same meaning over time, the word curse. Again, Curse is an Old English word, and it originally meant a statement intended to bring about pain or suffering or an evil fate. So it's the same sense that we have today when someone places a curse on someone. So a curse was in effect a call to God to inflict some type of harm on another person. Some of these curses from the 1500s and 1600s still survive in the language. 
you might hear people use phrases like, go to hell, or to hell with you. Another common swear is, god damn, which began as the longer phrase, god damn me, or god damn you. Again, these were all types of curses, and even during the Old English period, the word curse could be used to refer to someone who was speaking profanely or using blasphemous words. And of course, we still refer to swear words or obscenities as curse words. Now, in early American English, in the early 1700s, the R sound was sometimes dropped when it appeared before an S sound. And so a word like curse became cuss in American English. And that's why many Americans still refer to these types of words as cuss words. By the way, the same change converted the word arse into ass. But I'll have more to say about that later in the episode. So traditionally, words like profanity, swear, and curse were associated with blasphemous statements, statements invoking the name of God or violating the teachings of the church. But in the early modern English period, these terms started to acquire broader meanings. They came to refer to other types of words, words referring to people's private parts and bodily functions and sexual activities. And that change was part of a much broader change involving the use of obscenities. As the Middle Ages gave way to the early modern era, people became a little less concerned about swearing to God, and they became much more concerned about those words associated with the human body and the things that people do in private. And there are some interesting theories about why that happened. First, some scholars believe that traditional swearing and profanity faded with the decline of the feudal system. As I noted earlier, the entire feudal system was based on lord-vassal relationships, which were bound together by verbal oaths sworn to God. So swearing an oath was a really big deal, and it was taken very seriously. But when the feudal system declined and people started to negotiate for their labor services, those old feudal oaths lost much of their relevance. So oath swearing became less important, and the taboo against false swearing declined. There's also an interesting theory about the increased stigma associated with body parts and bodily functions and sexual activities. According to some scholars, these words became much more obscene in the early modern period thanks to a technological innovation that started to become common around the current point in our overall story in the 1300s. That innovation was the fireplace and chimney. This is the theory advocated by Melissa Moore in her book called Holy Shit, A Brief History of Swearing. The theory goes like this. Up to this point in history, people lived much more communally. There wasn't much privacy. For example, Anglo-Saxon society was centered on the hall, which was typically a large room with a fire in the middle. Everyone gathered around the fire in the hall, and in that large room, they ate and entertained each other and laid down to sleep at night. That type of communal living was still common in the late Middle Ages. Even as people moved into small houses, most of those houses still only had one or two rooms so people continued to live together. They routinely saw each other in various states of undress, and it was still common for people to urinate and defecate out in the open, in common areas. And when people went to sleep at night, they often shared the room with others, so it was much more common to see people sleeping together and even having sex. By most accounts, these were routine matters in the Middle Ages, they weren't scandalous, and therefore words associated with those activities weren't really considered to be all that taboo or dirty. But in the early 1300s, fireplaces were developed that could contain the heat of a roaring fire without collapsing or falling down. These fireplaces and chimneys could be easily constructed, and that allowed the fire to move from the center of the room to the walls. And it also allowed people to divide a large common room into smaller separate rooms. Each of those separate rooms could be heated with a fireplace. And that process allowed people to have a separate bedroom, and even a separate room with a chamber pot or bucket to use as a bathroom. Those changes gave people a greater sense of privacy. In fact, the word private was borrowed from Latin during this period. 
It's recorded for the first time in English in the late 1300s, around the time that Chaucer was working on the Canterbury Tales. The Latin word that gave us the word private also gave us the word privy for a bathroom. That word also appeared in English in the 1200s and 1300s. Through this process, private parts became private. Bodily functions were more concealed. And sex was hidden behind closed doors. All of that meant that those things were less seen in public and therefore less talked about in public. And over the centuries, words associated with those private activities became more taboo and were considered to be obscene. Now, that's an interesting theory, and there's probably a large amount of truth to it. But the fact is that people were uncomfortable with private parts and bodily functions and sexual intercourse even during the time of Chaucer. Those things may not have been as taboo as today, but when we read the Canterbury Tales, the characters don't really seem all that different from us. They share a lot of our modern attitudes and sensibilities when it comes to farting and burping and peeing and pooping and having sex. And there's no better example of that than one of the most popular stories in the Canterbury Tales, the tale told by the drunken miller. It's a bawdy and humorous story, and it shows that people were fascinated by potty humor and sexual romps even in the 1300s. The stories were entertaining because the subject matter was considered a bit scandalous, even at the time. This type of story was based on a literary style that had been very popular in France in the 1100s and 1200s. During that period, French poets routinely composed humorous tales about sexual escapades or bodily functions, and they often culminated with one character getting revenge on another character through some type of trick or joke. They almost always involved common people in common everyday settings, like a house or a barn or street. And in that regard, they're sometimes considered to be aristocratic in nature because they often depict common ordinary people as crude and uncivilized. So in that sense, they provide another link between the traditional sense of vulgar as something associated with the common people and the more modern sense of vulgar as something crude or crass or dirty. Interestingly, these types of stories were never really popular in English. Of course, English wasn't being used very much as a literary language when these stories were popular in France in the 1100s and 1200s. But Chaucer apparently enjoyed the style, and his examples in the Canterbury Tales are some of the very few examples found in English in the Middle Ages. Now, the French word for this type of story was a fablio, and Chaucer adopted this style for several stories in the Canterbury Tales, but the most well-known is probably the Miller's Tale. It's the second story in the collection, and it immediately follows the tale told by the knight. And in fact, it's told in direct response to the knight's tale. Chaucer juxtaposes these two tales right after the general prologue that opens the book. And they illustrate the stark contrast in his writing style. Both stories have a similar theme. They both involve a woman being pursued by two potential lovers. But the knight's tale is written in Chaucer's high register. It's an elevated courtly poem featuring traditional notions of medieval romance. It uses a lot of French and Latin loanwords, and it's actually based on a story that had been around in courtly circles for some time. Chaucer's version appears to be an abbreviated version of the story as told by the Italian poet Boccaccio several years earlier. As we've seen before, Chaucer was strongly influenced by Boccaccio. Despite the elevated approach of the knight's tale, it's immediately followed by the body story told by the drunken miller. His story has a similar theme, but it's written from the opposite perspective. It relies mostly on plain speech and a very high percentage of native English words. It has relatively few loan words, and it also uses language that's more colloquial and coarse, including words that were probably risque at the time. They were words not typically used in polite society or the royal court, but apparently they were quite common among drunken millers, and by implication, they were also common among the ordinary people on the streets and on the farms. Since the miller's tale is told in direct response to the knight's tale, let me give you a quick summary of the story told by the knight. In ancient Greece, two soldiers are captured in battle by the ruler of Athens, and they're taken back to Athens where they're held in a tower. 
the men are cousins named Palamon and Arcite. One day, they see a beautiful woman named Emily, and they both fall in love with her. But since they're being held captive, their love is in vain. Arcite is eventually released and allowed to return home. The only condition is that he can never return to Athens. But he misses Emily so much that he risks death and he returns to Athens in disguise. Meanwhile, Palamon escapes from the tower. With both men now on the loose in Athens, they soon run into each other and begin fighting over their love of Emily. The Athenian ruler discovers them, but rather than killing them both on the spot, he allows them to battle each other for Emily's hand in marriage. During the battle, Arcite defeats Palamon and wins the right to marry Emily. But immediately after the victory, his horse throws him to the ground and he dies. Both Palamon and Emily weep and mourn Arcite's death. And after several years, the Athenian ruler finally relents and lets them marry each other. And they both live happily ever after. So that's the gist of the knight's tale. It's a classic piece of courtly romance, the type that would have been told by a knight at a royal court in the 1300s. After telling the story, Chaucer tells us that all the pilgrims agreed that it was a noble story. The next tale was to be told by the monk, who was next in line in social rank. But the miller steps forward and objects. The miller is drunk, and he says that he has a noble tale of his own. Chaucer writes, And... By the arms and blood and bones, he swore. I know a noble tale for the occasion. An swar, biarmis and be blood and bonus, I can a noble tale for the nonus. So the miller begins by swearing, in the medieval sense of swearing. He swears by the arms and blood and bones of Christ. Again, this language is very different from that of the knight who had just completed his noble tale. And when the miller says that He has a noble tale of his own. That comment is a bit tongue-in-cheek because, as we'll soon find out, the tale is anything but noble. The miller is allowed to proceed even though it isn't his turn. But before recounting the tale, Chaucer issues a warning to his readers. He says that the miller told his churl's tale in his manner, told his churl's tale in his own manner or in his own way. So Chaucer admits that this is a churl's tale. By this point in time, the word churl was already being used to mean a rude or unpleasant person. So this was the story of a rude or unpleasant person, told in the manner of that person. Chaucer then begs the reader not to hold the words against him, because he's merely recounting the story as he heard it. And if the reader finds the matter to be offensive, Chaucer offers the following advice, first in modern English. Turn over the leaf or page, and choose another tale, for you shall find enough, both great and small, of stories that touch on gentility and holiness and on morality. And blame me not if you choose to go amiss. The miller was a churl. You well know this. So was the reeve and many others too. And obscenities and harlotries were told by the two. Make up your minds and hold me free from blame, And besides, men should not take seriously the playing of games. Now, in the original Middle English. Turn over the leaf and chase another tala, for he shall find thee noah, great and smaller, of storial thing that toucheth gentilessa, and eke morality and holinessa. Blameth not me if ye chase amiss. The miller is a churl, ye can know well this. So is the raver. And other a mani mo, and harlotry they told in both a toe, I visit you and put me out of blama, and ache men shall not mock an earnest of gama. So Chaucer says that he's not to blame for the harlotries conveyed in the following tales, and as I noted in the last episode, harlotries meant behavior that was considered obscene or crude, and he advises readers who might be offended to turn over the leaf or turn over the page and find another story that's more suitable. Now that's interesting because it shows that Chaucer was composing poetry that was intended to be read. Up until this point, most poetry was still being recited openly in public performance. But here, Chaucer acknowledges that most consumers of his poetry would be reading it in a book. 
and therefore they were free to turn the page if they found something objectionable. This points to the growth of the bookmaking industry during this period, and it's also another example of how society was becoming more private, as I noted earlier. Public performances of poetry were gradually being replaced with private readings. Now with that, Chaucer begins the Miller's Tale. The tale begins with a wealthy old carpenter named John. He lived in Oxford, and he rented out a room in his house to local students at the university. The current tenant was a poor student named Nicholas. Young Nicholas studied astrology and astronomy, and by observing the skies, he could forecast the weather and predict when it would rain. He was also skilled in the art of love. And this brings us to the old carpenter's wife, who was anything but old. She was a mere 18 years old. Her name was Allison, and the old carpenter was jealous of any man who approached her, so he kept her close and didn't give her any freedom. The miller says, For she was wild and young, and he was old. For she was wild and young, and he was old. The miller says that young Allison was very attractive, and she loved to sing and dance. And one day, while the old carpenter was out of town, the young student Nicholas made his move. The miller says, Now, sir, and then, sir, so befell the case, that on a day this clever Nicholas fell in with this young wife to flirt and play, while her husband was down Osney way. As clerks are crafty and fully quaint, and in private he caught her by the quaint, and said, Indeed, but if I have my will, for secret love of you, sweetheart, I will spill, and held her hard by her haunches, and said, O oh, darling, love me at once. Now in the original Middle English. No sir, and after sir, so befell the cas, that on a die this hand a Nicholas. Feel with this young weef to raj and playa, will that her husband was at Azaniah. As clerk has been full subtle and full quainta, and privily he caught her by the quainta, and sighed a, I wis, but if each have me willa, for their love of thy leman I spila, and held her hard by the hunch bonus, and sighed, Leman, love me all tonus. Now this passage is quite explicit for the Middle Ages, but there's one word in particular that stands out as part of our overall discussion about vulgar language. It's the part where Nicholas catches Allison by the quaint. Now, this is a play on words, which would have been very obvious in the time of Chaucer, but a little less obvious today. This is actually the original form of the word quaint, spelled Q-U-A-I-N-T today. Now, today, quaint typically refers to something pleasing, and usually something a bit old-fashioned. But originally, it meant clever or crafty, or something made in a clever or crafty way. So it also had a sense of something that was intricate or elegant. The word was applied to certain things at the time, like certain styles of dress, that later passed out of fashion. So over time, the word has acquired that sense of something nice and pleasant, but a bit old-fashioned. But again, that's a modern development. When Chaucer and other writers of this period used the word, it still had its original sense as something clever or crafty or intricate or elegant. When Chaucer used the word in this passage, he actually used it twice so that it rhymes with itself. Now today, if we're writing poetry, we don't normally rhyme a word with itself, but at the time it was perfectly acceptable to do that as long as each use relied on a different sense of the word. So in the first line, the miller says, as clerk has been full subtle and full quainta. Literally, as clerks be full subtle and full quaint. So he's saying that Nicholas the clerk was very subtle and very quaint in the original sense of the word as crafty or clever. So he was a clever clerk. But then in the next line he says, and privily he caught here be the quainta. And privately or secretly, he caught her by the quaint. Now, in this line, the word quaint is being used in that other sense as an intricate or elegant object. 
but it's also obviously a disguised reference to a certain word for a woman's private parts. Caught her by the quaint clearly means caught her by the cunt. But again, it's slightly disguised here, and it's made more acceptable by using the word quaint. Now, in case you're not convinced by that connection, Chaucer makes the same reference in another part of the Canterbury Tales, in the prologue to the tale told by the wife of Bath. She has a very explicit prologue where she talks about her five husbands, and she makes several references to her genitalia, using this word quaint, as well as the French term belle chose, which literally meant pretty thing. And Chaucer wasn't the only poet to use the word quaint in this way. Other writers during this period also used it in that way, so much so that the Oxford English Dictionary actually includes female genitals as an early and now obsolete definition of the word quaint. And this is a good example of how poets and writers got around the taboo associated with some of these words. And it implies that the word cunt was considered to be obscene even in the 1300s. But was it? Well, this points to one of the challenges in trying to trace the history of swearing and obscenities. If the words were truly obscene, they didn't tend to be used very much in the surviving literature. So the general absence of these words can be interpreted as a sign that the words were obscene. But it could also be the case that the words were simply unknown or not common in the language at the time. So when one of these words pops up in the literature, we have to look at the context to see if it was considered obscene. And if so, how obscene was it? Passages like this from the Miller's Tale suggest that the word cunt was obscene at the time because Chaucer didn't actually use the word. He only makes a disguised reference to it. And he's already warned us that the tale has strong language and adult themes. So he could have used the word if it was generally acceptable at the time. I actually gave another piece of evidence to support this view in an earlier episode. You might remember that the word countess was one of the first words borrowed from French after the Norman Conquest. But you might also remember that the English nobility avoided the male equivalent, which was count. Instead, they retained the native English title of Earl. So instead of counts and countesses, England had earls and countesses. And I mentioned in that earlier episode that some scholars think that that happened because the word count closely resembled the word cunt. Both words would have been pronounced very similarly during that period and prominent nobles may have refused that French title because it so closely resembled an English word that was considered vulgar or obscene. Again, that's just a theory, but if it's true, it's further evidence of the stigma associated with the word cunt. But there's also contrary evidence, which suggests that the word was relatively common in the language, and it wasn't really considered all that vulgar. Before examining the conflicting evidence, let's consider what we know about the origin of the word. Frankly, the ultimate origin is unclear. Other Germanic languages have a very similar word with essentially the same meaning, so it's generally believed that the word goes back to the early Proto-Germanic speakers on the continent. There are some suggestions that it may have Indo-European roots because Latin has the word cunus with a similar meaning and a similar taboo. That word actually gave us the word cunnilingus. But most scholars today doubt that the Latin and English words are related, despite the fact that they are similar in sound and meaning. Though the word cunt appears to have Germanic origins, it isn't found in any Old English documents. Now, that may be because it was in the language, but it was considered so obscene that the Anglo-Saxon scribes didn't use it. Of course, another possibility is that the word disappeared from Old English altogether. At any rate, the word appears for the first time in writing in the 1200s, and that may be because it was reintroduced by the Vikings. Old Norse had essentially the same word, which was kunta, and it's possible that the Norse version of the word was borrowed into English without the same taboo as the native version of the word. And over time, it may have spread into the common language used by the ordinary people. 
As we know, many Norse loanwords don't pop up in the surviving documents until after the Norman conquest. And that's what happened with this word as well. As I noted, it's first found in English documents in the 1200s. But interestingly, when it first appears, it appears in place names. The first recorded use of the word cunt appears in a document from the year 1230 where it's used as part of a street name in London. Believe it or not, the name of the street was Grupo Cantalana, literally Grope Cunt Lane. The street apparently had a lot of brothels, so that appears to be the origin of the name. During this period, the word was also used in medical textbooks to translate the Latin terms for female genitalia. So again, that implies that the word was considered to be the acceptable English term at the time. It also appears in some surnames, like Godwin Clawkunta and John Fielkunt. But in those cases, the word may have had a different meaning. So as we put all this evidence together, we get conflicting signals. Some of the evidence suggests that this was a very naughty word, and other evidence indicates that it was quite acceptable. However, it is possible to reconcile this conflicting evidence. For example, it's possible that the Norse version of the word had filtered into the language and had become somewhat acceptable during the early Middle English period, at least by the people on the streets, which is why it became part of a street name and certain surnames. But in some corners of society, especially among the upper classes, the word was still considered obscene. So that may explain why the nobles rejected the word count around the same time. If there was a social or class division at one time, it appears that the old taboo won out, and the word once again came to be viewed as vulgar and obscene. And that old street called Grope Cunt Lane was later renamed as Magpie Lane. Now, speaking of groping, I began this digression with the student Nicholas groping young Allison in the Miller's Tale. In the story, Allison initially rejects the advances and pulls away. She says that her husband is so jealous that he will kill her if he discovers that she's having an affair. Nicholas tells her not to worry. He can easily outsmart her husband and keep their affair a secret. He says, A cleric had literally beset his wheela, but if he could a carpenter be gila. In modern English, it reads, A clerk has spent his time poorly if he can't fool a carpenter. The two young lovers then begin to kiss and make out. A short time later, Allison goes to church where she meets a young parish clerk named Absalon. He is effeminate and proper. His hair and clothing are perfectly arranged. He loves to sing and dance and play the guitar, which was a type of guitar. So he's lively and joyous. But there are some things that disgust him. The miller says, But truth to tell, he was somewhat squeamish, of farting, and of dangerous speech. But so to sign, he was sum del squeamus, of farting, and of speech dangerous. So prim and proper Absalon didn't like foul smells and vulgar language. Here, the miller uses the word farting, but was that considered a vulgar term at the time? Well, Chaucer uses it here without reservation, so it doesn't appear to be all that vulgar. You might also remember that I talked about that same word in the early English song, Summer Is He Coming In. It has the line, the buck verteth, which is generally interpreted as the buck farts. The F sound was often pronounced as a V sound in the south of England and in the West Country. So, if that was the intended meaning of the word in that song, it was one of the first recorded uses of the word fart in the English language. Now, that doesn't mean that it was a brand new word in the language. There's at least one manuscript from the Old English period where the word is used to translate a Latin word for flatulence. So, it appears to have been around during the Anglo-Saxon period. But again, it wasn't generally used in Old English, so it may have been considered a bit vulgar even back then. By the way, the word has cognates in the other Germanic languages, so it appears to be a very old word, much older than the surviving documents tend to suggest. It may even go back to the original Indo-Europeans. 
Remember that the Indo-European P sound became an F sound in the Germanic languages. So if it came from an Indo-European root word, that ultimate root word would have begun with a P sound. And many scholars think that there was such a root, and it gave us the word partridge for a type of bird, as in a partridge in a pear tree. The word is apparently derived from an Indo-European root word for flatulence, which passed into Greek with the same general meaning. The Greeks used that word for a specific type of bird which had fluttering wings and made a sound when it was flying around that resembled flatulence. The word ultimately passed through Latin and French and was borrowed into English in the early 1300s. So, believe it or not, fart and partridge are apparently cognate, both being derived from the same Indo-European root word. Whatever the age or history of the word, it was becoming much more common in English documents by the late 1300s during the time of Chaucer. But it still represented something that many people found squeamish, including the prim and proper character of Absalon in the Miller's Tale. He's repulsed by flatulence and foul smells, but he's not repulsed by young Allison. When he meets Allison in church, he's immediately attracted to her. And the miller says that if she were a mouse and he a cat, he would have caught her straight away. That night, Absalom takes his guitar, or guitar to the carpenter's house to serenade Allison. He strums his guitar and sings to her. But Allison has no interest in him. She's only interested in Nicholas. Absalom returns on many nights to sing beneath her window. But his singing only keeps Allison and her old husband awake at night annoying both of them to no end. Meanwhile, Nicholas devises a plan to spend an entire night with Allison by tricking her old husband. One day, Nicholas remains in his room all day, and the old carpenter starts to worry, thinking that his young tenant might be dead. When he goes to check, Nicholas is just sitting there, staring up in the sky with his mouth open, apparently in a trance. The old carpenter awakes him and asks what's wrong and Nicholas tells the old man to grab a chair and sit down. He tells the old man that he must swear not to tell anyone, but based on his astrological calculations, a great deluge will begin the next Monday night, and it will consume everything, just as Noah's flood did in the Bible. All human life will perish. The old man begins to panic, but Nicholas explains that he has a plan. They can do what Noah did and ride out the storm in a boat. Since there isn't time to build an ark, he tells the old man to build three large tubs, one for the old man, one for his young wife, and one for Nicholas himself. The carpenter is to place the tubs in the rafters of the barn. On the next Monday night, when the rain is to begin, they are all to sleep in their respective tubs, and when the water rises, they will cut a hole in the roof and float away in the tubs and survive the flood. The old carpenter thinks this is a great idea, and he spends the next few days building the tubs and hanging them in the rafters of the barn. That Monday evening, they all climb into their respective tubs and await the rain. But the old man grows tired and falls asleep, and this is all according to Nicholas's plan. He and Allison then climb down and head to Allison's bed to spend the night together. But who should show up at the window but prim and proper Absalon? Since no one has seen the old carpenter for several days, Absalon assumes that he's gone away on another trip, so he sees an opportunity to once again show his affection for Allison. Finding himself outside of Allison's window, he tries to get her attention. The miller says of Absalon, and he coughed softly in a quiet tone, "'What do you, honeycomb, sweet Allison?' My fair bird, my cinnamon sweet, awake, my darling, and speak to me. Now in the original Middle English. On soft he coughed with a semi soon, what do ye honeycomb, sweet Alison? Me fair breed, me sweet cinnamon, me awaketh, layman mean, and spaketh to me. Alison finally reaches her breaking point with Absalon as he's disturbing her on the only night she has to spend with Nicholas. She yells at him to go away. She says that she's in love with another man. She warns him, Go forth thy way, or he will cast the stone. 
go forth thy way, or I will cast a stone. Absalom begs Allison for a kiss before he goes. He says that he will leave once he has his kiss. So she goes to the window, and the drunken miller recounted what happened next in the dark of the night. He says, The window she undid, and did so in haste. Have done, said she, come on and do it fast, lest that our neighbors should look and spy. This Absalom did wipe his mouth all dry. Dark was the night as pitch, and dark as coal, and at the window she put out her hole. And Absalom, he felt no better nor worse, but with his mouth he kissed her naked arse, most savorously, before he was aware of this. Aback he jumped, something was amiss, for well he knew a woman has no beard. He felt a thing all rough and long-haired, and said, Oh my, alas, what did I do? Tee-hee, she laughed, and closed the window too. Now the same passage in the original Middle English. The window she undoth, and that in hasta. Have do, quoth she, come off and spade the faster, lest that your neighbors they as be. This Absalom gun weep his mouth full three. Dirk was the nicht as peach, or as a coal, and at the window would she put her hole, and Absalom him feel no bet a worse, but with his mouth he kissed her naked airs, full savourly as he were war this. Abaki stirred and thought it was a miss, for well he wist a woman hath no beard, he felt a thing all rough and long he heard, and sighed, Fee, alas, what have I do? Tehe, quoth she, and clapped the window toe. So Allison let Absalom have a kiss, but it wasn't the kind of kiss he expected. As the miller put it, he kissed her naked arse. As I noted earlier, the word arse lost its R in early American English, and arse became ass in much the same way that curse became cuss. Now we sometimes refer to obscene or vulgar words as four-letter words, and technically speaking, arse is a four-letter word. It's just lost a letter in American English. And to be fair, most Middle English versions of the Canterbury Tales spell it E-R-S, so it was sometimes a three-letter word back then as well. Arse is another word that can be found in Old English, and in fact, it has Indo-European roots. And that's a good reminder that most of these risque words tend to be very old words and tend to go back to Old English and even to the older Proto-Germanic language. Arse is no exception. In fact, these types of words are sometimes referred to as the Anglo-Saxon. If you resort to the Anglo-Saxon, you're using vulgarities. That also explains why these words tend to be short, simple words, usually spelled with three or four letters, because Old English words tend to be short and simple. Also, I should note that the passage I just read concludes with Allison giggling and saying, Tee-hee! And that's still a common way to express laughter in writing, and this passage is one of the earliest known uses of that expression in the English language. So Allison laughs at Absalom, and Nicholas laughs at him too. Now Absalom is furious. He rubs his mouth with sand and straw and insists that he will get his revenge. He goes to a nearby blacksmith's shop and gets a red-hot poker. He then returns to the house and knocks on the window as before. This time, Allison suspects a thief, but Absalom identifies himself and says that he has returned with a ring given to him by his mother. He will give it to Allison for another kiss. The passage continues with Absalom's request. This will I give you for another kiss. But Nicholas had risen for a piss and thought that he would carry on the joke, to have his arse kissed by this stupid bloke. And so he opened the window hastily, and put out his arse quietly, over the buttocks, his entire bum, and then said this clerk, this Absalom, Speak, sweet bird, I know not where thou art. Just then this Nicholas let fly a fart, as loud as it were the sound of thunder, and nearly blinded Absalom down under. But he was ready with his red-hot iron, and on Nicholas's arse did he smite him. 
now in the original Middle English. This woli yeva they, if thou me kisa. This Nicholas was the reason for to pisa. And thought he would a mend in all the japa. He should kiss his horse, ere that he scapa. And up the window did he hastily. And out his arse he putteth privily. Over the bulltuck to the haunchabon. And therewith spake this clerk, this Absalon. Spake, sweet breed, he not not where thou art. This Nicholas unknown let flay a fart, as great as it had been a thunder dent, and that with the stroke he was almost e blint, and he was ready with his ear and hoot, and Nicholas amid the airs he smote. So clever Nicholas got a red hot poker on his bum. Now I should note that the miller begins this passage by noting that Nicholas was out of bed because he had reason for to pisa, that he had arisen to piss. This is another four-letter word, but it's not an Anglo-Saxon or Germanic word. It's actually a French loan word. So it's the first vulgarity we've encountered so far that was borrowed from French. I should note that this same word can be found in many other modern Germanic languages, but they have all apparently borrowed the word from French. It doesn't appear to be a native word. This is also another word related to a bodily function that became much more vulgar over time, perhaps because it became less common for people to do it in public. By the 1800s, it had become so vulgar that people just reduced it to its first letter, P. It was similar to the way we refer to the F word or the C word or the S word today. And over time, P came to be spelled P-E-E, and it still remains the more acceptable version of the word today. Now, in the story, Absalom has gotten his revenge by striking Nicholas on the butt with a hot poker. The miller says that Nicholas began to scream and cry. He ran around yelling, Water! Water! The noise and commotion was so loud that it awakened Allison's old husband, who was still asleep in his tub. And Hearing the scream, water, water, the old man assumed that the deluge had begun and the flood was about to take him away. So he cut the ropes that were holding the tub in place. But with no water, the tub fell to the ground, breaking the old man's arm. The neighbors came running to see what was happening, and when they arrived, they saw Nicholas and Allison laughing at the old carpenter. The old man told the crowd that he had hung from a tub in the roof of the barn because a flood was going to wipe everyone away. The miller says that everyone laughed at the old man and thought he had gone mad. Even Nicholas and Absalom laughed and made fun of him. The miller concludes the tale with the following lines. And every person laughed at all this strife. Thus sweeved was the carpenter's wife. For all his keeping of her and his jealousy... And Absalom had kissed her nether eye, and Nicholas had scalded his butt painfully. This tale is done, and God save all the company. Now in the original Middle English. And every wished gone laughing at this strief. The sweeved was this carpenter's weef. For all his caping and his jealousia, and Absalom had kissed her nether ear, and Nicholas is scalded in the tota. This tale is done, and God save all the Rota. Now, the most notable thing about this concluding passage is the statement, Thus sweeved was this carpenter's weef. Thus sweeved was the carpenter's wife. Now, we don't really use that old word sweeve or swive anymore, but it's an old word for sexual intercourse. It basically meant screwed. And in fact, the word sweeve was derived from an old English word that meant to revolve or turn or screw. So sweeve was basically the medieval equivalent of our modern word screw as a slang term for sex. And it was apparently a very vulgar term at the time. It wasn't the type of word that you would find in the knight's tale or some other noble story. You would only find it in a churl's tale like the miller's tale. Now, even though this old word sweeve has largely disappeared from the language, it does have some closely related cognates that still survive. It's a Germanic word, 
and as I noted, the Old English root word meant to revolve or turn. But it also had a more general sense of a repeating motion. So it could refer to either a circular motion or a back-and-forth motion, and that probably explains how it came to be used as a term for sex. That root word also gave us the word swivel, which is based on the sense of something turning or revolving. It's also closely related to the words swift and swoop, both meaning to move quickly. And it's probably related to the word sweep, perhaps via the Norse version of the word. Sweep has that sense of a back-and-forth motion. So sweave, swivel, swift, swoop, and sweep are all related. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. If sweave was a vulgar term for sex in Middle English, and Chaucer used it here in the Miller's Tale, then what about the F word? Did he also use the word fuck? Well, no. Chaucer never used that word. But apparently, he could have, because it was probably around during the late 1300s when he composed this tale. This is another one of those words where we have very limited evidence before the 1500s, probably because the word was considered to be extremely vulgar and obscene during that period. Now, I say probably because, once again, we have some conflicting evidence in the historical record. The traditional view is that the word fuck was first recorded in an English document around the year 1500, so about a century after the current point in our overall story of English. And when it appeared, it was actually disguised through the use of a special code. The writer spelled the word by substituting each letter in the word with the following letter in the alphabet. So it was similar to the way Chaucer disguised the word cunt by employing the word quaint. In both cases, the context implies that the words were so vulgar at the time that a writer couldn't just use them openly. The words had to be disguised by either using a similar sounding word or by spelling the word in an odd way. This first recorded use of the word fuck is actually part of a poem that's composed in a complicated mixture of Latin and English. The word appears in the following passage. Non sunt in caeli, quia fulcant vivis of aeli. Again, it's a mixture of Latin and English, but if we translate it, we find that it's a passage condemning the local monks in the town of Ely, near Cambridge. In modern English, it reads, They are not in heaven, because they fuck the wives of Ely. Now, the word is rendered as fulcant, F-U-C-C-A-N-T. But as I noted, the scribe replaced each of those letters with the following or next highest letter in the alphabet. So in the document, it's actually spelled G-X-D-D-B-O-U. And if you try to decipher that on your own, it's pretty straightforward. But you may wonder why the U was replaced with an X and not a V or W. Well, remember that U, V, and W were not yet distinct letters. They were all considered to be different ways of writing the letter U at the time. They became distinct after this manuscript was composed. So here, the scribe went directly from U to X. By the way, there's another passage in this same manuscript that used the word sweave, which we saw earlier. That's the word that Chaucer used in the Miller's Tale. In modern English, the line in the manuscript reads, Brothers with knives go about and sweave men's wives. But again, the word sweave is disguised in the same way by using the next highest letter in the alphabet. So that implies that both sweave and fuck were too obscene to be used openly in this particular manuscript. Now, I began that discussion by noting that that's the traditional view of the first recorded use of the word fuck. And that particular document with the disguised spelling is also the oldest citation for the word in the Oxford English Dictionary. But a few years ago, in the year 2015, a historian at Keele University in England named Paul Booth found three examples of the word being used in the early 1300s. The examples are found in legal documents from the years 1310 and 1311. And all three examples are actually references to a man who had a very peculiar surname. 
His name was Roger Thucked by the Naval. Yep, that's right, Thucked by the Naval. On two occasions, he was called to court to answer a criminal charge, which isn't actually specified in the document. On the third occasion, the legal case was decided, and Roger was outlawed, and presumably never heard from again, which may be a good thing given that surname. The nature of that surname suggests that it was intended as a derogatory surname, implying that Roger was too stupid to know how to have sex. But what's most important about this particular surname is that it seems to be a clear example of the word fuck being used in the early 1300s. By the way, most modern scholars agree that the word fuck was around in the Middle English period, as well as the Old English period, even though it wasn't generally used in documents. And that's because the word appears to have cognates in several other Germanic languages, including Middle Dutch, Norwegian, Swedish, and German. The related words either have a similar sexual meaning or they mean to strike or thrust. So that implies that this is yet another Germanic word, even though the lack of evidence in the written record makes it difficult to trace the history beyond the 1300s. So we've seen how Chaucer incorporated a wide variety of vulgarities into the Miller's Tale, and many of those words are still considered to be very offensive perhaps even more offensive today than they were in the time of Chaucer. Late in Chaucer's life, before he had a chance to compile a final version of the Canterbury Tales, he wrote a short passage which was intended to be the conclusion of the book. It's known today as the Retraction, and in it, Chaucer asks the reader to forgive him for anything that the reader should find offensive in his works. Specifically, he begs forgiveness for his sins, and his translations and indentinous of worldly vanities, his translations and writings of worldly vanities. He then includes a summary of all the major works he composed during his lifetime which might contain offensive material. In each case, he simply included the name of the poem, but when he got to the Canterbury Tales, he described it as the Talus of Canterbury, Dilk that Sawan into Sina the tales of Canterbury, those that tend toward sin. In the years that followed Chaucer's death, the relatively small number of people who could afford to purchase a book clamored for a copy of the Canterbury Tales. As I noted in an earlier episode, it was one of the first books to be published in England when William Caxton set up his printing press in the late 1400s. But by the 1600s, as people became more concerned about private parts and bodily functions and sexual activities, the Canterbury Tales started to become too controversial for many readers. What had once been seen as risque or slightly vulgar had become outright obscene over time. During that period, something obscene or disgusting came to be described as Chaucer's Jest, and people started to refer to a bawdy or vulgar story as a Canterbury Tale. The first dictionaries were also produced around that time, and at first, obscenities and vulgarities were included in those early dictionaries. But in the 1700s, those words started to be left out. They had become too obscene to even be listed as English words. Samuel Johnson's 1755 dictionary was considered to be the definitive word on English words at the time. Its impact still reverberates today, and Johnson also chose to omit those words. But a funny anecdote involving Samuel Johnson suggests that people weren't always as offended by those words as they claimed to be. Supposedly, two ladies approached Johnson one day and thanked him profusely for not including those naughty words in his dictionary, to which Johnson replied, What, my dears? Then you must have been looking for them. So I'm going to conclude this episode on that note. Next time, we'll conclude our look at this very prolific period of English literature in the late 1300s. And we'll do so by shifting our attention to the north of England, which will serve as a reminder that Chaucer's English was only one dialect of English at the time. We'll see how Chaucer dealt with those regional differences in the Reeves tale. And we'll also take a quick look at Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which was composed during this same time period in a northwestern dialect 
that was very different from Chaucer's London dialect. So, until then, thanks for listening to the History of English podcast. Mm-hmm.